My whole life, I always planned at some point I'm gonna do a multi-instrumentalist record where I play all the instruments myself. Um, I always planned on doing that someday. But when? When to do it? Well, then a fucking pandemic happened. Uh, so it was kind of like, like, remember at the beginning of the pandemic, especially when it was like, you do not leave the house. Like back when like you couldn't get toilet paper and that was a thing. Um, it was sort of like the perfect timing for me to just like disappear into a room for a year and just write and record and write and record. Um, with the full support of the rest of the guys from Mariana's Trench who uh, were all totally good. The band is still totally good. This is just what I did with my time during the pandemic. Uh, and then, I sort of started to have this idea of like, maybe I should get um, a whole bunch of other singers to, to do feature vocals with me. Um, that would be fun. I don't think anyone's gonna appreciate it if I just go and make a Mariana Trench album by myself. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. Um, so I gotta do something different. So what does that look like? And then I sort of thought to myself, well, rather than concerning myself with uh, what genre it is, um, why don't I try and set up a project where I try and do a different genre on every track? Um, and what kind of a writing exercise might that look like? And you know, uh, just focus on good songs and don't worry about what box this fits into, just go for it. Um, so it's really sort of like a, a scatter shot of a whole bunch of styles of music that I like. I mean, it's definitely a pop record, but it's a lot of different areas of pop that go in there. And uh, it's a wild ride. Track one is Lady Mine. I think it's pretty obvious what that one's about. Um, but musically, I was really trying to do, I was really trying to do something like throwback and 70s and something that felt like, maybe something like what Lenny Kravitz might do. When I wrote this song, I was kind of like, who could I ask to sing this? And then I was sort of like, who could sing this? And then it quickly became, I only know one person who could sing this. <laughs> this, song's a, this song's a screamer. There's just no getting around that. Um, and there are parts where when Josh's voice and my voice get to a certain range, you almost can't tell them apart a couple times. It sounds very similar. I think what's fun about hearing both of us on this song is it doesn't really sound like a song either of us would be associated with necessarily. Like, yeah, it's it's like rocking, but it's not really Chad's kind of uh, kind of rock that he that he does with Nickelback. It's, uh, it's definitely like I don't I don't I don't think I've ever heard Nickelback doing anything with like a big horn section and stuff like that. Um, but like I knew Chad would sound awesome singing that melody, um, and he does. He sounds great. And right away, Josh is just screaming on this thing and he's I mean it's high really high and I wasn't sure what part he wanted me to sing or what I was supposed to do and so I I started you know screaming some parts on it and and trying to find little spaces where I think it would sound good and and sent it back and Josh was like that's perfect you got it like that's it that's all we need my favorite part of the tune has to be the outro when everything, there's just this cacophony of, of instruments and our voices and there's ad-libs going on everywhere and it gets really chaotic and the energy level just goes through the roof. And I, I definitely find myself reaching over and, and, uh, and cranking up the volume when I'm listening to it in the car. Okay, so track two is Blame It On The Beat. Um, I'm very proud of it. Uh, it was a lot of fun to make. Um, there was, uh, you you had the story of the womp, bumpa, bumpa, ba bump, 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 right? Is that gonna be part of this thing? So we've been talking about like, like what if we have kids one day? Um, and uh, so we've been suggesting like names to each other. Now hear me out. Womp, bump, 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 bump. Rant. All one word. You think it's ridiculous, but it's actually pretty catchy. It's actually kind of like a beat, like womp bump a bump, ba bump bump a bump bump. Ramsey. What was that name I was naming my kid? Womp bump a bump ba bump bump a bump I always wanted to write a big band swing tune. I'm a huge fan of the genre. When I was all through high school, I was the drummer in the big band, so I, you know that's still very near and dear to my heart. Um, the only thing I did differently from like a traditional like jazz big band song is the the form of the song is more of a pop structure. Like it is still like verse, pre-chorus, chorus, uh, bridge. Like it, it still follows like a normal thing. Whereas like most jazz standards are usually like uh, verse, verse, bridge, verse. Um, so it, it 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 does have more of a pop structure. Um, I also wanted it to be more accessible for people that maybe don't listen to big band swing. Um, but it was a lot of fun to make. So it's sort of like an updated 
at least my take on the genre. It's a, it's a little more modern in terms of like close mics and stuff, because like old big band swing was like not close mics at all. It's just kind of like a room mic. <laughs> and so it was like, it's a little more, uh, it's a little more clear than some of those old recordings, I guess. But uh, yeah, that one was, uh, was a lot of fun to make. Track three is Best of Me, which was a fun one to work on. Uh, I haven't done a lot of country. I have done some country for other people, but I've never had to deliver a country vocal myself before. Um, and that was actually the hardest vocal for me on the record, even though it's not um, it's not vocally like super challenging or anything, but um, just to try and get my voice to sound like a country singer, but have it still feel authentic and not sound like a caricature or like an SNL skit or something. So actually I worked probably that that vocal took me probably the longest out of anything on there. And then when Dallas came on board and as soon as he sang on it, then it really got a lot more country. He really brought a lot of character to that. It's really cool how Josh had, had found that sort of middle ground for me and really know really knows what would sing well for me and, and, and to write that way uh, for my voice. Um, it was, it was a breeze to sing, and it was really fun to, to be able to hit the gas where I could hit the gas, because he knew exactly where I could hit the gas and where, you know, so. That song, I was hoping he would sing on, so I actually wrote that song with him in mind, so like, I was always picturing his voice singing that chorus melody, um, and I was super stoked when he agreed to do it, and he did such an amazing job. He nailed, he nailed that vocal, his vocal, uh, we recorded that at the warehouse, and it took him about 15 minutes, and he looked like he wasn't even trying. <laughs> He's a great singer. Uh, it's a dream project. I can imagine putting some, something like that together, right? So to be involved in this was a huge honor right from the first email I got, and uh, I'm glad I'm here, and I'm glad it's done. Track four is called Army of One, and it is just symphony, sort of film score sounding piece of music. Um, basically, after I had finished working on the song for my dad, um, that was the full symphony. Um, when I was working on that song, um, I thought I wasn't going to be able to record any real symphony players um, because of COVID. So I basically went out and I bought like every every good symphony sample library, and I was just like testing them out because I thought I was going to have to be able to like it was going to have to all be fake. Um, so. Once I finished working on the song for my dad, and now I had all these crazy ass sample libraries, um, I was still sort of inspired to like play around with them and stuff. So I just like started writing some instrumental stuff. And uh, Army of One certainly sounds like a big epic uh, film orchestra, but it is all done on a laptop. That's all just samples. Track five is You and I. So I originally wrote this song for Walk Off the Earth. They, uh, they, uh, Johnny texted me and asked if I would write a song for them. And so I wrote You and I, um, which is why it kind of has that like sort of world beat type, type reggaeton type feel to it because they do a lot of that stuff. And for the demo version that I sent them, I just I needed some female vocals on there because they have male and female vocals and I was working with Fion at the time so I asked them if they could just like take 10 minutes and just like sing a couple takes of the chorus so I could just mix their voices in there. We were actually in uh, the studio recording some of our stuff for our record and he asked us if we could sing uh, backup vocals on a song that he had actually written for another artist but then decided to keep for himself and that's kind of how we ended up collaborating on that one. Um, Walk Up the Earth didn't end up using the song so it came back to me and I was like well I'm working on this record I'll just throw this on there um, and so I asked the girls if they would come back and like actually sing a verse and and make it like a real true uh, duet um, and they did and they sounded awesome I just really think that all three of our voices in the chorus make it really stand out we're a harmony based act and Josh is so good with harmonies I just think it was a really great mix for this song so track six is delirious um, so I really wanted this one to be, it's very vibey. I, I really wanted to have a lot of vibe and it's funny, like uh, I think it comes across as being like a, a, like sexy and it's got this sort of sexy vibe to it, but it's actually about uh, alcohol withdrawal. We both bring like our, our flair and our vibe and naturally we sound different, you know, the way we pronounce words, the way we sing, our influences, you can kind of hear them when we, when we sing our stuff. So I just think it was just cool to have two Canadians come together and boy and go singing a song, you know, it's a dope song. I was working on it, I was just thinking like, you know, it'd be really interesting to get someone with a different vibe than me to, to sing on this. And then I thought, um, I was like, oh, I wonder if Fifi Dobson would do this because she's got such a, she's got such a great voice. And I, I thought, 
I thought it would be a fun thing for us to do together because I think like we both do pop music, but we both kind of have like the heart and soul of a rocker, you know? So I, I thought that was a that was a fun collab to do. I classify us both as pop rock artists, you know, over the years, and um, our voices are both very powerful. Uh, his voice kicks my ass, though. I mean, his voice is so powerful. He does crazy gymnastics with his voice. It's pretty amazing. Um, I was like, damn, I didn't know this boy could sing like this. Years earlier, like uh, maybe like five years ago, um, when the MMVAs was still a thing, I remember uh, we were both at an after party together and I was like, yeah, we should work together sometime. And she was like, yeah. But I really don't remember the night because I was super drunk, so <laughs> I was pretty lit. Um, I just remember his, his big smile and his energy. And I'm, I'm sure she probably thought that it was just like, and we're drunk and we'll never talk about this again. Um, but, uh, but I'm glad we finally got around to it. Track seven, Painted Faces. So it was very important to me that if I was going to do an album where I was doing as many genres as possible, um, that there be something from the very rock, rock world in there. Um, I know that like Lady Mine is rock, but it's like 70s rock. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it, I'm gonna do a grunge song. Um, and But I took it really seriously, so I, I like looked up uh, I did a bunch of research on like what are the exact guitar pedals that like Kurt Cobain used to use and like from what year and made where and like scoured the internet to find all of the correct stuff and uh, the, uh, the the guitar tone on that song I really spent a lot of time on. I always record cymbals separately so that it's cleaner and mixing so we have to put up a pillow for me to hit because uh, when I try and play without my right arm I fucking suck! I also had, I had a lot of fun playing the drums on that one just because it's like so trashy. Uh, you know, it was, it was fun to do that one. Track eight is Spellbound, which is one of my favorite songs in the record. It's very important to me because it's a song I wrote for my mom. We're here at the beautiful Warehouse Studios once again. I love working here. It's Brian Adams Studio. It's one of the nicest studios in the world. Um, for this song, this is a song I wrote for my mom, and um, my mom was very light and bouncy and magical. So I wrote a song for her called Spellbound. And what I'm going for is the sort of 60s, almost goofy, Beatles-y kind of songwriting where it's like an upbeat pop song, but it's all on symphonic instruments, sort of like the arrangements that George Martin used to do for the Beatles. This is my friend Hal Beckett. We have done several records together. Yes, we have. Hal brings all of my orchestration stuff to life and makes it all work. Thank you. And I thank him so much for <laughs> Thanks for the work and it's great. Yeah, um, so, the, the second half of that section, once you guys are rising, I like it, I liked it like that, but those first hits when you're, when it's descending, yeah. Ah, yeah. we really want to land on the one. Uh, okay. Ah, oh, like nice short, ah, okay, okay, cut, two. Yeah, okay, try. and like really crescendo into okay. it. Ah. Um, I learned a lot of lessons recording that song. Um, that string part is super difficult, even though it's, it's not difficult to play, but um, because it's all, so short spiccato and they're so exposed because it's only one player per part. It's a string quintet. It's a really sort of Beatles-y, it's like a, you know, it's a pop song with all symphonic instruments. So we're going for that like Beatles-y, bordering on goofy almost even, with, especially with some, well, both of your parts have a bit of goofiness to them. That was the first time in my career when I had the brass players in there, like the trombone and the tuba and stuff, that I was actually giving notes like, can you play it goofier? Can you make it goofier? Um, but I knew, like, if I was going to write a song for my mom, um, I wanted it to feel like her. And, and that song does feel like her. It's, it's, it's still musically actually, like, quite complicated, even though it sounds simple. Um, all the arrangement stuff is, is I, think, I think my mom would have been happy with that. I think she would have thought it was crafty. Track nine is Try Me. I was going for something that would sound like a combination that something like maybe like CeeLo Green would do mixed with a little bit of Justin Timberlake and maybe a little Pharrell. Um, just sort of like a little bit of all of those, those sort of flavors. And of course what I ended up with was just insanity instead, uh, but that's kind of what I do. And I sent that song to one of my friends, Dave Genn, who produced the first movie on his trench record. And I said, uh, what do you think of this? Uh, I know it's busy. And he came back with, well, it is a little busy, but you know, there's something about you that's always just a little too much. So I think it's okay. 